Good morning, Jerusalem. Is it well with your soul? This week begins the annual spring break for many of our children. And in light of the mass restrictions being lifted and more places opening up, I am sure that a lot of individuals will hit the road for a short vacation or just a quick getaway. I want to encourage each of you to be safe whether you hit the road or not. Make sure that you remain vigilant wherever you go. And I know that it's a common practice to Facebook and uh, Instagram folk to share with them the wonderful experience that you're having in real time. However, I want to encourage you to consider waiting until you get back to share those precious moments. See, the fact is, somebody who is up to no good is waiting to see who will not be home so they can make themselves at home with the stuff in your home. Don't give them that chance. So let's look out for everyone so that we can have a all have a safe week together. Also, you know, we, the state convention will be convening this week, and you can check out some of the sessions virtually. So go to the convention's website at gmbsc.org for more information. Turns me now to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. That's Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. And there we'll find these words written. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for life and life more abundantly in Jesus Christ. We thank you for opportunities you give to us to enjoy family, to relax and to have some form of recreation in our lives. And we thank you for the protection and the safety that you give to each and every one of us. God, I pray now that even as individuals make plans and preparations to go venture out and to visit other folk during this time, keep them safe, give them traveling grace and journey mercy at their destinations. And God, protect all the things you provided for them concerning their homes. And most of all, God, let them not forget to acknowledge and recognize you each day for the grace and mercy that you give to them for their well-being. Now, God, we do pray again that you give us ears to hear, hearts to believe, and wills to carry out your divine will in our lives. And we will bless you forever because you are God and God alone. Thank you now, we pray. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. This morning, my brothers and sisters, I want to talk about for pure eyes only. That's right. For pure eyes only. As we've considered these Beatitudes each Sunday, I pray that you have been able to see the progressive connection that each one has with the other. As a matter of fact, it is as if Jesus is building the framework for the whole of the life of the believer. And as we study God's word and obey it, he adds flesh to the frame through various applications. We have seen from the beginning that as we acknowledge our poverty of spirit before God, it opens up the privilege for us to have access to all the spiritual blessings that God has in store for us. And just to add that if you ever feel that you are in need of a blessing from God, go read Ephesians chapter 1. There you will find how blessed you really are in Jesus Christ. We then saw that our state of poverty of spirit moved us to mourn and rely on God for our comfort, which he alone is able to supply and even as he supplies us the comfort we need, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says, because God is the God of all comfort, 
He is able to give us enough comfort to comfort other folk with the same comfort that he gives to us. What a blessing that is. Now then, our being comforted by God humbles us and we're made meek in order that the power of God can not only rest in us, but that it can be used to gain or inherit the world for Christ. That is what Paul meant when he wrote in 2 Timothy 2.25 that in meekness, instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. But see, we are only able to do that as we hunger and thirst after God's righteousness. We must have a longing desire for God's truth. Even as the church at Thessalonica did. Paul said in Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, verse 13. For this cause we thank God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God. You received it not as the word of men. But as it is in the truth. The word of God. Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Listen. When we accept God's word as God's word, we will never be satisfied again with anything less than his word. As a matter of fact, you ought to be saying, Pastor, we want you to preach longer because we were getting the word of God and we are hungry and thirsty for more. Yeah, I know what some of y'all are saying. Yeah, listen, we need to sing the song, Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Well, then when we are filled with God's word and his righteousness, we will not be as self-righteous as we are. And then we'll be more merciful toward others because we realize how merciful God has been to us. Paul, again, as I've shared before, does an excellent job of this, in describing for us the blessedness of God's mercy that we talked about last week. When he told us that he had quickened us who were dead and trespassing sin even though we had walked according to the course of this world. Every way we, the world went, we went that way too. We were guided by Satan who's the prince of the power of the air. And we lived our lives catering to our flesh doing whatever we felt like we were doing even if it didn't feel good after we did. We kept on doing. We were by nature the children of wrath. In other words, we were worse than baby kids. But God, who was rich in mercy for his great love, loved us even when we were dead in trespass and sin and quickened us together with Jesus Christ. In other words, that's what mercy is. He gave us what we don't deserve and gave Christ what we deserve. That was God's mercy. Well, now that we see what God has done, it should help us to see him better. Thus, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now, the religion of Jesus Christ is one that focuses upon the heart. And I use the word religion because in juxtaposition to the religion of the Jews, the religion of Jesus far exceeds it. All man-centered religion is external. It looks on the outward appearance. And if it looks pleasingly pure, then man is satisfied. Jesus, however, aimed his teachings at the heart because he understood that there can be no true reformation until the heart is pure. The New Testament teachings in it emphasizing heart transformation, not the head. Now, of course, there is a need for doctrine and understanding and teaching which is aimed at the mind. And many folk will just stop at a mental ascent to the word of God. But Jesus goes much further than that. See, just a mental acknowledging of God is not enough. You remember James said, you believe in God? Well, that's good. But the devil believe also and he trembles. So it's got to be more than just that mental ascent. But also understand, it's not just our hands or something that can be done. See, there is no external act 
to put man in line with God. You remember the rich young ruler that said to Jesus, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? But after Jesus told him what was needed, he could not make the heart commitment that was necessary. Jesus even warned the Pharisees and the scribes about their external religious rituals in Matthew 23. And several times he warned them by saying, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And then he adds that, woe, you hypocrites, or you religious fakes. You see, and the one that is so telling about them is in verse 27 when he says, you are like whited sepulchres or tombs which indeed appear beautiful on the outside, but inwardly you are full of dead men's bones. In other words, you are very unclean. And therefore, we must be certain that we understand this. Yes, we must have some head knowledge about God, and we must do some things toward God, but those things do not automatically make you right or pure and hard before God. And let me throw this one at you. It is not even your environment or what church you attend that makes a difference. A case in point. It was in paradise, the garden of God, that man failed. He was in the perfect environment. He was developed intellectually and walked with God. Yet that environment did not keep him from sinning against God. So let that be a thought for those who push the social gospel agenda thinking that if you just give folks food to eat and jobs to work and health care and nice home and nice communities that things will get better and they'll be better. No, my brothers and sisters, it is not the head or the hands nor the environment alone that will get it, but it's the heart. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Well, what is the heart then? Or what do we mean by that? Well, when we say heart, we're not talking about the old ticker inside of us that keeps our blood flowing as important as it is. But by the heart, we mean the center of man's being. It includes the intellect, the will, and the affections. It is the total man. It is his intentions as well as his motives and his desires. See, when a person says, I love you to my heart, what they mean is, I love you not with my stuff, but with myself, with all of my being. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about the heart. And even if I had time to cover it all, I could never exhaust its application. So let me just say a few things in line with the text. So stay with me. Jesus one day was asked by Pharisees what was the greatest commandment and his response was love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and then love your neighbor as yourself then he said on these two hang all the law and the prophets well that's what's required but the problem is we can't do that without divine help because Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know? It? And then we're told in Mark chapter 7, 19 through 23, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So my brothers and sisters, until there is a divine change on the inside, we are heartless, literally. But then Luke chapter 6 and verse 45 says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth with that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. So in essence, Jesus says, 
It is the type of heart that you have that will determine what you produce in life. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 22 to 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, our text says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let me give you a, another analogy to help make my case. In the Orient or in other places around the world, the king is seldom seen. In other words, it's not just an everyday occurrence that the king shows himself publicly just because folks want to see him. No, it was on, only on rare occasions that this happened. And when it did, it made that moment the more special. That's why in the book of Esther, the fact that she risked her life for her people, it was so sacrificial because unless the king called for you, you just didn't see him when you felt like it. And Esther knew that being unannounced, she could lose her life. But because she was in the will of God, it all made the difference. Well, if that's the case, now you can understand why we can't see the heavenly king any kind of way. The text says, only the pure in heart shall see God. So why we can't see God like we want? Well, that's the cause, and here's my first point. I know you've been waiting on it. We are impure in heart, and impurity of heart causes spiritual blindness. That's right. An impure heart causes spiritual blindness. And when you are spiritually blind, it's hard for you to see yourself, much less see somebody else. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells the people about judging and tells them to, you know, get the beam out of your own eye before you try to get the speck out of your brother's eye. And then in Matthew 20, he tells a parable of the workers in the vineyard who went out at different times of the day and when they returned, they all received the same wages. But there were some who were complaining, who said he was being unfair to them. Now, this is really interesting, and it reminds me of a lot of ungrateful folk today. For starters, when you read about those folks in the text, they didn't have a job in the first place, and they were standing idle in the market, and someone came and offered them a job. Secondly, they had agreed to what the wages were going to be. So that was already in, in, in stone. But then thirdly, what the other folks got was really not any of their business. They should have just been worried about what they got. But even though they were complaining, listen to what the good man of the house said in verse 13. He called them friends. And then he tried to explain them the nature of ownership and the right of the owner to do as he pleases. He says, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine I evil because I am good? You see, an impure heart will cause you to be blind to God's truth. And that blindness will cause you to mess other folk up if you're trying to lead him. That's why Jesus says in Luke 6, 39, can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall in the ditch? And therefore, purity of heart, which allows one to see God, is done without hypocrisy. There's no pretense. It is not perfection, but simply being honest with yourself. Being pure in heart means you are sensitive to sin. Even if you fall into sin, you don't take it lightly. It bothers you. And you immediately bring it to God in repentance. Yes, an impure heart will cause spiritual blindness. And so we then got to ask, as we've done before, how do we become pure in heart? Well, that'll lead me to my second point, which is this. We become pure in heart by faith. That's right. We become pure in heart by faith. Our hearts are purified by faith as we yield to God's word. Our faith is strengthened in him. It's a divine work. And being a divine work, 
We must rely on divine help, which only comes from God through his word. The beauty of this is seen in David's realization of his need for mercy and cleansing. You know, uh, remember we've shared Psalm 51, where David cries out, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. See, because David was a man after God's own heart, he had to acknowledge his sin and transgression before God. And even though his actions were toward Bathsheba and her husband Uriah, David said that one he really had offended was God. David knew that he needed something that only God could supply. He needed an overhaul on his heart. You know, that's no wonder why we resort to the Psalms as much as we do. Because they were written by a man who had found much comfort and peace in God and talked so much about the cleansing of the heart by the word of God. Psalms 12 and 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure as silver, tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times. Psalm 26, 26 says, With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure. Psalm 19, 8 says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 119, 140 says, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loves it. And then Psalm 24, 3-4 says, Who shall ascend under the heel of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. And that leads me to my last point, which is this. The pure in heart shall see God. See, when you are pure in heart, you can sing like the songwriter says, oh, I want to see him. Look up on his face there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. And if that's your sincere desire, the promise is we shall behold him. Yeah, John said in 1 John 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 2 to 3, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath hope in him purify himself, even as he is pure. Yes, we need God to give us clean hearts so that we can see him, so we can serve him, and we can live for him. Yes, to see God is for pure eyes only. And the way that you get your eyes pure is by going to the eye doctor, the great physician, and his name is Jesus. The remedy for our spiritual blindness was revealed at Calvary. The blood of Christ was shed for our sins. Our spiritual poverty was diminished. Our comfort had come. The meekest one had been humbled and a hunger and thirst the world was in need. Mercy was the only thing that could help us because we had lost our way. And on that cross, Jesus died for us. He opened our blinded eyes and allowed us to see the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. He died for sinners like you and I, was buried in a borrowed tomb for three days and nights. But early Sunday morning, that first day of the week, he got out of the grave with all power and authority in his hand. And because he got up, he is now able to cleanse our eyes. He's able to make us pure so that we can see God in his beauty and in his holiness. We can't see God on our own. But thank God that the word says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I don't know about you, 
But I want to see him one day. And that's why every day I ask the Lord to cleanse my heart so that I can see in his word what he wants me to do and how he wants me to serve them. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word today. It is definitely a challenge to me and a challenge that we all need to really look at and consider where we are with you. We know, oh God, that in and of ourselves, we have nothing to bring to the table. There is nothing that will allow us to be in your presence except for Jesus Christ. So we thank you that you have allowed us the privilege to see you through Christ Jesus. Thank you again, oh God, for what you've done for us. And help us to always make sure that our hearts are pure by your word, that we can see you at all times. God, we love you and we thank you. And we praise you for not only what you've done, but most of all, for who you are. Give us clean hearts. And Lord, we will serve you. Thank you so much again. We ask it all in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, as we go away, let us remember what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. And don't forget as you go, forgive somebody because someone needs forgiveness now. And as the opportunity presents itself, share the love of Jesus Christ with those you come in contact with. And remember, at Jerusalem, we are ministering with eternity in view.